So last night, the House of Representatives took a largely symbolic vote, basically just to reaffirm Joe Biden's ban on Russian oil imports to the United States. And uh, the overwhelming majority of both Democrats and Republicans voted in favor of the ban. But we did have some defectors on both sides. And uh, the only two Democrats that I saw that voted against this piece of legislation were Ilhan Omar and Cory Bush. And so I kind of wanted to get into exactly why they decided to take this position and uh, give you guys my thoughts on whether or not I think that they're correct to do so. So they say here from Newsweek, just to start us off, why Cory Bush and Ilhan Omar joined Republicans in voting against the Russian oil ban. So before we get into this, understand the context. I've seen in response to them taking this vote, especially with Ilhan Omar, uh, who is already uh, on a normal day, one of the most hated members of Congress and gets absolutely horrible attacks, uh, racist attacks from Republicans and even from liberals in many cases. But um, the, the response that I've seen to them taking this vote has been just absolutely disgusting. I mean, people calling her a, a traitor, uh, people posting uh, clips and threads uh, under her tweets of, you know, dead Ukrainian children to try to guilt her or to try to make it seem as though uh, her voting against this piece of legislation is somehow her in favor of what Vladimir Putin is doing right now. So just an absolutely horrible response, both from liberals and conservatives condemning her for this. So I figured let's go ahead and uh, explore exactly why she actually did this. So they say two Democratic members of the House of Representatives voted against legislation to ban the import of oil, gas, and coal from Russia on Wednesday night. And they say Representative Ilhan Omar of Minnesota's 5th Congressional District and Representative Cory Bush of Missouri's 1st District joined 15 Republicans in opposing the Suspending Energy Imports from Russia Act, and the bill was introduced in response to the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. And they say the bill passed by a vote of 414 to 17, but it isn't yet clear if the Senate will now take it up the legislation, which is separate from President Joe Biden's ban on Russian energy imports announced on Tuesday. And uh, Omar said on Tuesday that she would vote against the bill, saying that a ban wouldn't end well for the people of Russia or for those living in Europe, and the EU is heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas. So uh, that was the short explanation for why she did it, but I wanted to read to you guys the entire statement that she just put out, basically explaining in detail why she took this position. So uh, let's go ahead and get into this. Here's what she had to say. She says, quote, I oppose the Suspending Energy Imports from Russia Act, a bill that mandates a complete ban on Russian oil imports. And the president clearly already has the authority to take this step. So again, kind of redundant to vote on this piece of legislation, given that Joe Biden is just doing this unilaterally and he was already going to be doing this uh, this oil ban. But they say uh, President Joe Biden has the authority to take this step, uh, evident in that President Biden announced such a ban yesterday. Uh, but putting the specifics into statute with no sunset and no conditions for lifting the ban creates a dangerous scenario, one in which we are taking uh, today's policy question and making it tomorrow's political question. So I think this is a really good point here um, because if there's no sunset and there's no conditions to get rid of this ban, then you're not even really giving Vladimir Putin the opportunity to say, well, here's X, Y, and Z actions that you could take right now in order for us to lift uh, some sanctions or in order for us to lift the ban on Russian oil. So in other words, you're not even giving him an off-ramp. Uh, you're only providing the, the opportunity for escalation uh, within this conflict, which is the exact opposite thing that you should be trying to do right now, right? I mean, the whole point of doing sanctions in the first place under, you know, the, the framework of somebody who thinks that sanctions are going to be effective in uh, pushing Vladimir Putin to do something, the whole point of doing sanctions, the whole point in their minds of doing this Russian oil import is to do what? It's to try to pressure Vladimir Putin to stop the invasion, right? It's, it's to try to push him to the position where he feels like he has no other efforts than to, or no other, no other ability other than to either give up the invasion or to come to the table and uh, make some diplomatic concessions or to have some diplomatic talks. So if the goal is diplomacy, if the goal is to end the invasion, then you're not providing any off ramps. So how the fuck is that going to provide for a, a situation where you could possibly have those diplomatic efforts? It doesn't. It's just an escalatory move. And that's kind of what she's saying there. But uh, they, she continues saying, uh, the last time the Congress passed significant trade restrictions on Russia was the jackson Vanek Amen Amendment of 19. 1974. And uh, like this bill, it was motivated by genuine concern for human rights and human security. It was not repealed until 2012, more than 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, well after its useful usefulness had expired. And she says, I have serious concerns that the suspending energy imports from Russia Act will become yet another clear example where a policy stays on the books well past its utility because the political will to lift it has never materialized. And she continues saying, one more thing, uh, one thing that is very clear is that our 
dependence on oil means a dependence on tyrants and uh, this has always been true and there's no meaningful principle at play in a decision to ban russian oil but seek it from saudi arabia instead and she says i am strong i am also gravely concerned that this ban will mean ramping up domestic oil production and yet another reason why we must continue to move to a green economy that is proven to be the most reliable and cost efficient so in the broader picture of things, she's absolutely 100% correct that you know transitioning to a renewable energy system where we can get our energy either from you know nuclear or from the sun or from wind or from hydro, etc. All of these different renewable energy sources that would actually be energy independence, right? Republicans are coming out every single day and they're talking about we need to be more energy independent and oh under Donald Trump uh, we were much more energy independent. No, the fuck we weren't. I mean we're, we're dependent in multiple different ways if, if we're using fossil fuels in the way that we are right now. Number one, we're dependent on uh, petro-state dictators like Vladimir Putin, uh, like Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, uh, like MBZ of uh, the UAE, or even like, you know, Venezuela or Iran or any other fucking sources. Uh, we are dependent on petro-state dictators. That is not, you know, jumping from one to another, jumping from Russia to Saudi Arabia as our petro-state dictator of choice. That doesn't, you know, give you the moral high ground in any way, shape, or form, which is the other point that she was making right there, right? In, in the long sense, yes, you transition towards renewable energy, but in the short term, sense, you know, if the whole point of this is to take a moral stand against the invasion, then how does switching to Saudi Arabian oil uh, improve that in any way, shape, or form? I mean, Saudi Arabia is conducting an ongoing genocide in Yemen, where millions and millions of people uh, are being bombed with U.S. weapons that we have sold them over years, um, and, and, and people are being starved out by an ongoing blockade that is being uh, enforced by Saudi Arabia. So how does jumping to Saudi Arabia, another petro-state dictatorship, how does that give you the moral high ground? It doesn't. So if the question is, on a moral ground, you've basically completely admitted that you're not actually trying to take a moral stand because you're not going to a moral source. Uh, source. There is no moral consumption of oil. There is no ethical sourcing of oil. Okay, that's not how this works. But so in the immediate sense, you're not even taking the moral stand that you're pretending that you are. On the economic front, uh, it's unclear what this is going to do to actually pressure Vladimir Putin to end the invasion. I mean, he has money stored up. Do people not understand this? That historically, the way that sanctions work typically, uh, we've seen this in Iran, we've seen this in Venezuela, we've seen this in uh, North Korea, plenty of other examples. When you level sanctions against a country that has an authoritarian grip on that country, it usually doesn't affect the people who are the higher ups, right? So that's why you only usually would try to be doing like targeted sanctions against Vladimir Putin directly or seizing the assets of the oligarchs or targeting the oligarchs directly. But doing these broad sanctions or completely trying to implode the entire Russian economy, that is not the same thing. That is not targeted. And on top of that, from an economic framework, it's not even clear that that's going to pressure Vladimir Putin to stop the invasion, okay? And I told you guys about this the other day, but uh, what we've seen so far, and this is a tendency that, again, has been historically consistent, is when you start imposing these types of sanctions, when you cut them off from the SWIFT banking system, when you basically completely isolate them from the rest of the world financially, it doesn't mean that the people of Russia are just going to magically rise up and overthrow the Putin regime. That is not what's likely going to happen. And in fact, especially when you have a limited information sphere, and right now, Russia is not even giving media outlets or uh, you know activists the ability to describe what the invasion of Ukraine uh, is actually materializing to look like. You're not allowed to even call it a war in Russia. We have thousands of protesters who are bravely going out uh, but are being thrown in jail for criticizing Putin and criticizing the war. So when you have an information ecosystem like that, people are not going to see the sanctions. They're not going to see the economic devastation and then come to the conclusion of, oh, this is 100% Vladimir Putin's fault. In all likelihood, and again, this has been very consistent throughout history, in all likelihood, we're going to be seeing what we what we're seeing right now on full display which is that uh vladimir putin's popularity within russia has actually gone up it's gone up okay so the, the point is not to to say we shouldn't punish putin the point is not to say we shouldn't punish russia for taking this offensive imperialist action the the, the question on the table is is this effective, right? Are these sanctions actually going to be effective? What is the end goal, okay? Is punishing the Russian people, destroying their economy, and, uh, you know, plunging them into economic hardship, is that even going to achieve the goals that you are stating that it is supposed to achieve, right? Is it going to get them to overthrow the Putin regime and install somebody else? No, that's not going to happen. That's completely unreasonable. Is it going to force Putin's hand and, and take away the economic ability for him to continue to fund the invasion? No, I don't think that that's uh, all too likely that they would be able to do that within a 
time frame that's going to be effective in any way, shape, or form. And on top of that, you're also just completely negating the the idea or the uh, understanding that you know the United States has a global hegemonic control over the economic structure, but you know China also exists, right? And Russia, what we're seeing right now, is forming a much closer economic bond with China. So they're going to be subsidizing a lot of the economic hardship that Russia is facing in the immediate sense. And in the long-term sense, you're going to see that economic relationship develop into a much more cohesive block if we continue these sanctions. So again, it's not a question of not punishing Putin. She agrees. We should punish Putin. We should go after the assets of the oligarchs. We should be uh, sanctioning Vladimir Putin directly. But the question is, are these broad bans on Russian exports, are these broad sanctions of cutting them entirely off from uh, the, the international financial system, is that even going to be effective in bringing about the desired results of uh, diplomacy at the end of the day? And I think, no, they probably won't. They're only escalatory. They are only going to serve to increase the likelihood that Vladimir Putin feels like he is backed into a corner and has no other choice but to continue this violent imperialist action that he has been taking. So again, I think these are entirely fair questions. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you guys off with this because we have seen this historically play out where a handful, or even in this case with Barbara Lee, uh, a single member of Congress takes a stand against the overwhelming majority of people uh, when there's a war going on, when everybody has the drums beating and it's you know hard to sift through the, the energy and the propaganda that everybody is feeling in a moment like this. And uh, we can look at things like this and try to get you know somewhat of a, uh, a, a historical example of what it looks like when somebody goes against the grain and uh, later turns turns out to be proven exactly correct. So uh, just as a reminder on Barbara Lee in Afghanistan, uh, they say here from the Washington Post, she was the only member of Congress to vote against the war in Afghanistan. Some called her a traitor. And uh, they say Representative Barbara Lee faced death threats, insults, and hate mail after she voted against a broad authorization uh, used to carry out the war in Afghanistan. And uh, just a quote here from her, she said, however difficult this vote may be, some of us much urge, must urge the use of restraint. Our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's take a step back for a moment. Let's just pause just for a minute and think through the implications of our actions today so that this does not spiral out of control. And that's the main point there at the end of the day is you're trying to prevent escalation, right? All of us who are looking at the current situation, you, you understand that Vladimir Putin is at fault. You understand that he deserves to be punished for this, that the Russian oligarchs who are enabling this to happen, they deserve to be punished and held accountable for this. But you have to do that in an effective way. And I think a, a lot of people right now are caught up in this moment and trying to do, you know, trying to just throw out whatever maximal pen penalties you possibly could for the entirety of Russia. I mean, we've seen insane xenophobia uh, come out and branch off of uh, this war where, you know, uh, New York Russian restaurants and shit are getting vandalized or people are leaving, you know, horrible reviews on their websites and refusing to go and uh, use their businesses. We're, we're seeing a ridiculous amount of all of this energy and buildup that's similar to the buildup uh, pre-Iraq war and pre-Afghanistan uh, war as well. And so you got to just take a step back, like Barbara Lee was just saying, analyze the situation and say, are these going to be effective?